welcome to the November meeting of the Pinal Gem and Mineral Society and the Pinal Geology and Mineral Museum. Les Presmick is our guest tonight, and he will be talking on the Arizona Silver Belt. And I hope that uh, you will enjoy it. I'm, I know it's a good talk. And let's see, I'm going to add him in now. I'm going to embarrass him. No, uh, I'm going to add him in now, unless you're about to go live. So, you know, put down your cup of coffee. Uh, there you are. And there, now you're big. Uh, your microphone should be working too. But okay. Can you, can everybody hear me? You are a little bit low, but. Well, then I'll get closer to my computer. Okay. Uh, it is. Uh, it's a, you are a geologist and mining engineer and a mineral collector of long standing. Is that correct? Well, that's one one set of titles. I'm I'm a retired mining engineer with forty three years of experience and mineral collector for fifty eight years and and uh, involved in various aspects of the hobby and the business. Well, excellent. And you're going to further introduce yourself, and um, I will, let's see, what are we doing here? I'm going to add, I'm going to add your, there you go. I'm still getting the hang of this. It's only been three months, so. <laughs> uh, well, so we're you're all learning. Talk, yep, you're going to talk about the Pioneer District, Silver King, and Magma Silver Queen Mines, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, a slight change from the original title. Yes. Uh, I, I wrote a, a long article for the mineralogical record uh, a year or two ago about the Arizona Silver Belt, which extends from the Silver King Mine outside of Superior to the Stonewall Jackson, just north and west or east of Globe. But as I was getting ready for this presentation, I realized that there were some of the, the pictures that, that I thought I had um uh, escaped me <laughs> yeah. and, and so uh, my fallback is i'm going to speak on the pioneer district which concentrates solely on the area in and around superior arizona and just north of there at the silver king and, sounds and good so what uh, what I'm going to do is I want to let everybody know they can add their comments and questions in the YouTube chat. Uh, you may have to sign in to do that, but uh, uh, or you can, uh, and uh, then I will interrupt less and uh, occasionally and ask questions from him. And uh, otherwise, I'm going to uh, disappear and turn off my microphone and let t Les take it away. Yeah, I already let Bob know that as, as questions come in, uh, I'm more than comfortable taking them on a uh, as presented basis. So any questions that you have about anything that we're talking about, feel free to, to send those questions in. So I am an Arizona native. I graduated from the University of Arizona in 1975 with a degree in mining engineering. And besides working at the magma mine for nine years and San Manuel down the road for another two. I spent the last 30 years uh, in the fuels department at Salt River Project buying coal, overseeing some of the coal mines that we bought coal from and the uranium uh, fuel for a Palo Verde nuclear generating station. In addition to that, I had the, I have spent a great deal of time in community service, not just in the the gem and mineral hobby uh, and with various organizations there, including 35 years as, as on the show committee for the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show and in various in leadership positions in the Tucson Gem and Mineral Society, the Flag Mineral Foundation, the Mineralogical Society of Arizona. Uh, I've also spent a fair amount of time pretty much the last 30 years, very much involved with my community here in the, the town of Gilbert. So now that I'm retired, it's a good thing that I am because I'm keeping busy full time and especially helping to get the new U of A Alfie Norville Gem and Mineral Museum ready to open sometime in January. 
Most of the collection has been moved from the basement of the Flandrau Planetarium on the University of Arizona campus, where it's been housed for the last 20 or 30 years, to the historic Pima County Courthouse in downtown Tucson. Uh, we'll be ready to open that by the middle of January, whether it opens or not, it will be up to the University of Arizona and where we are in uh, the with the COVID issue. But I will tell you that once that museum opens, it's going to be well worth uh, the trip south to take a look at, at this most modern and absolutely fantastic uh, gem and mineral museum. So I would encourage all of you to plan on a field trip at some point once you hear that the, the museum has opened. So with that, let's let's go to the, the subject this evening, the Pioneer District, uh, which the two main mines were the Silver King and the magma are originally known as the Silver Queen mine. So just to put us in uh, a little bit of perspective, Superior sits in the north central portion of, or the center northern per portion of Pinal County, uh, just up the road 30 or 40 miles from the, the county seat of, of Florence and, and a few more miles from, from Coolidge. So the history of this area starts in 1872. A small uh, army reg regiment under the, the leadership of Colonel Stoneman was sent into the area to establish a route, build a road, basically over what we now know as, as Apache Leap or, or the, the limestone cliffs a few miles north. And one of the things that virtually all the army troops did when they were sent to the territory of Arizona was in their spare time, they would go out looking for their bonanza. Well, 1872, one of the, uh, the troops, gentlemen by the name of uh, Sullivan, did discover a hillside that had these very suspicious looking black heavy rocks on them. He put a few of them in his, his saddlebags and did not tell any of his uh, fellow soldiers about this. In 1873, after he mustered out of the army, he went to work for a rancher down near Florence and shared the uh, these black rocks with him. And of course they intrigued the rancher but then not too long after that, Sullivan just took off. There were some suspicions that he may have tried to go back up and relocate his, uh, what would turn out to be rich silver deposit, maybe en ending up, uh, you know, dying in the desert or, or meeting up with, with some less than friendly, friendly Indians, but he was out of the picture. So 1874, small group of these ranchers um, put together a prospecting trip in their off season when the, the crops were already brought in and they had nothing better to do. So four of them headed up to the Stoneman grade, both with the idea of trying to find Sullivan's prospect and then they they weren't successful. They went went on to the globe area, found a few, or set up and and claimed several claims in that area. Came back in 1875. They they did it again a year later, and in 1875 they did rediscover the outcrop. The report that you see on the left was. Uh, done on the Silver King Mining Company uh, about 1880. And so very quickly, the, uh, the ranchers started to do some development. They uh, 
started sinking a shaft on this hillside or at the top of this hill. What was interesting about their early efforts is they, they, um, when they brought the ore up, they separated out the very shiny material from the dull black material and thinking that the shiny material was the rich silver, that's what they shipped to the smelter in San Francisco. Unfortunately for them, the shiny stuff was galena that was pretty much barren of silver and the black dull rocks that they threw out on the dump were actually the high grade silver sulfide. They figured something was not right when they got instead of getting a, a handsome check back from the smelter, they actually received a bill from the smelter. Uh, so it actually cost them to send, send this material all the way to San Francisco and get it, get it smelted. Now remember back then, the closest, there were no railroads. So they had to haul all of this material by 20 mule team to Yuma, put it on a ship, sail it all the way around the tip of Baja California and then back up to San Francisco because that was the, the closest smelter. Well, about a year or so into this process, there were a couple of miners that came down from the Comstock load, stopped by the Silver King and recognized that it was the dull black rocks that had the real values. So they made a proposition with these ranchers slash mine owners that they would get this stuff processed for half the proceeds. Well, this time the check coming back from the smelter was indeed a bit richer. Now, by this time, the mining interest in San Francisco caught wind of this and started to make offers to the four owners, the four ranchers that were the original claimants. And one by one, they sold out because the fear was that this was just going to be a relatively shallow deposit and you never knew when the ore was going to run out. One other interesting uh, sidelight of, of the history, they actually found the first claim that they found in the area was the Silver Queen. And we'll talk about that in, in a moment. So here's what this, the photograph on the left what Silver King looked like in its very early days, 1876, 1877, not much going on. By just two years later, the picture that you see on the right, now we have a, an established mining camp. There's a two-story building just to the right of center and just below center. That was the mine superintendent's home. And we'll see a picture of that later. That, that building actually stood up until about eight. 1980. There was a, a hermit woman that lived there for a number of years in the 60s, 70s, and uh, 1980 or so, and, and she passed away. And that's why the building was kept in, in relatively good shape, at least preserved. Unfortunately, not too long after that, somebody decided they wanted to watch it burn and they set it on fire. Um, that's a, a shot of that two-story building in about 1978. Uh, as you can see, it was fairly well maintained, relatively speaking, but there were no other buildings in the area. The picture on the left is a shot of the, the town site and mill. Again, the two-story building is to the right center, and uh, the mill and, and sorting areas are those buildings to the left. Here's a rather handsome shot of some of the, the employees of the Silver King. I thought it was interesting that they, they grouped the mining engineers and the mechanics together as the, the elite group, if you will, of skilled people working at the mine. The photograph on the right is of the, the mine superintendent's home. This is the ground floor. And of course you see this, uh, the stairway going up to the second floor. That's about a 150 pound chunk of probably almost solid silver. There are a couple of stories about the mine superintendent. This mine was so rich that he supposedly 
had a three foot long silver wire that he fashioned into a hat band and wore it around his cowboy hat as he you know, went about the mine and then on down to Hastings and, and various other places. And at one time, the store owner down at Hastings asked for a small chunk of silver ore. And he asked two or three times. And then finally, a hundred pound chunk of almost solid silver showed up on his doorstep as a gift from the mine superintendent. He tried to send it back and the mine superintendent wanted to take it that he was more than welcome to, to keep it. The high grading at the mine got so bad at one point that they actually shut the mine down for a day uh, in order to, to just let it be known that this was not going to be an accepted practice. So once the ore was hoisted, uh, to the surface and some preliminary sorting was done at the mine site. These 20 mule teams would transport the ore down to Hastings, pretty much the site of about where the Boyce Thompson Arboretum is today, because that's where the water was. Uh, Queen Creek flows right through there. So that was the source of water for the, the milling operation. And so each one of these wagons would carry about a ton of rock. And as you can see, it took a lot of mules and a lot of these wooden wagons to move the, the ore from the mine down to Hastings. And so very quickly, the mule skinners figured out that instead of using whips to spur their mule team on, that they would grab chunks of rock out of the wagon right behind them and, and just throw them at the mules. Well, doesn't take much additional effort to throw a chunk of high-grade silver ore as, a, as, it, as it does a chunk of waste. So these mule skinners would have their associates follow behind the wagon and pick up all these chunks of high-grade ore. At one time, that road was said to run $10 to the mile. And this is Hastings. As you can see, Picket Post Mountain is in the back. This was the real settlement, because again, this is where the, the ore was processed, concentrated, and then shipped by 20 mule team down to Yuma, because the railroad had still not gotten anywhere close enough to, to make it feasible to, to ship by rail. And then on to San Francisco um, to have it refined. So the Silver King ran from about 1875 or 1876 up through the mid 80s. There was a slight revival of the mine in the early 1890s and then that collapsed with the Sherman Silver Act that pulled the or that demonetized silver and pulled all the government support. So the price went from, I think, over a dollar an ounce down to 20 cents an ounce. And that pretty much killed virtually all of the silver mining in Arizona, the demise of Tombstone, the Silver King and a number of other properties. Fortunately, some of the specimens, some of the rich silver that was extracted from the Silver King didn't make it to the, the refinery. There weren't really many mineral dealers that were coming into the area at the time because it was quite, quite an adventure, quite, quite an arduous trek to, to get into this area. Because remember, we're still, by 1880, 1885, they're just starting to to do things down in Bisbee and Morency and and the railroads just weren't in Arizona. Uh, but like I say, fortunately, some some of the the silver specimens have escaped the refinery, did not get turned into to coinage. The specimen on the left is a little over two inches tall. 
The one on the right is a little over three inches wide. Uh, two more specimens. The one on the left in Paul's collection was interesting. He's an attorney and mineral collector up here in Phoenix. Some of you may have, have heard of him. But he got a call from a friend of his back in New York and said, I'm dealing with this estate. And when I looked on the, the mantle, there was this little thing that looks like a silver. He said, I'm not sure, but, you know, would you be interested in seeing it? And so Paul said, absolutely, yes. A picture was sent, and that specimen now resides in his collection. The piece on the right is almost four inches tall and is in Evan Jones's collection. It's, it's more uh, classic wire silver. This specimen came to him originally labeled from the globe area. But when we were looking at this specimen, when I was re doing research for my article, the back side of it is 50% sphalerite. Well, the reason that that is important is because sphalerite was not an ore mineral, but it was one of the predominant sulfide minerals at the, the Silver King. There are there was a gentleman by the name of W.P. Blake that was a uh, geologist and spent a tremendous amount of time in Arizona and the Southwest back in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, and into the early 1900s. And he wrote a series of, of reports and, and uh, notebooks on all of the mines that he visited. The Silver King was one of those. And in an unpub unpublished report that he did for some of the stockholders, there are descriptions of chunks of greenish sphalerite with wire silver sticking out of them, uh, sketches of amethystine quartz crystals three and four inches long with wire silver sticking out of them. Unfortunately, the reason that we don't see a lot of these things is his vast mineral collection before he moved from back east out to Arizona where he spent his last decade or two burned to the ground. And so all of those mineral specimens that he had acquired over his entire working career were destroyed. Two more silvers. Uh, the one on the left is about two and a half inches tall from Barb Munchen's collection. She's a collector down in Tucson. The one on the right is about two and a half inches tall. That's one that, that we have in our collection. As you can see, a lot of the Silver King silvers are the, not, these nice, uh, what we call herringbone type crystallization. Two more, uh, more of a wire silver on the left. That specimen is a little over three inches tall, um, sits nicely on matrix. The one on the right is, is really quite a, a chunk of crystalline and crystallized silver. It used to be about 60% bigger than this. It was a specimen that I acquired back in the late 70s. And it was originally labeled from the Stonewall Jackson mine over at McMillanville. But a friend of mine, uh, when he was doing research for a, a presentation that he did on Arizona silver, contacted the American Museum where this specimen came from. And it turns out that it's actually a, a Silver King specimen. And when I acquired the piece, there was a weak point, I'll call it in a, about the center of the specimen, but, but weight wise, this is about 40% of the piece and the other one is, is about 60% of the piece. And originally I had sold this specimen to the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, but then later I went back and I decided I liked this one because of the crystallization is a little bit nicer and was able to, to swap the, the two and I got this one back. There are other minerals that occurred at, at the Silver King. Stromyrite was actually the main ore mineral. Stromyrite is the silver analog of bornite, bornite being the very rich copper iron sulfide. Stromyrite is copper silver sulfide. And, but there were other minerals, very few of which have been preserved. 
This is the only acanthite after pyargyrite that I know of in Evan Jones' collection. That's about two inches tall. The acanthite with calcite is in our collection, again, about two inches tall. That came, came to me 40 plus years ago at the Tucson show, had a little handwritten label on it, it said Silver King, Arizona, USA. And it was from a European collection. And nobody could figure out an alternative locality to it. So uh, the label has stuck and I'm certainly pleased to have it from the, the Silver King. So I mentioned the Silver Queen. That was actually the first claim that the, the for, Florence my, uh, ranchers located in the area. The first two or 300 feet, relatively high grade silver. Unfortunately, once they got down to about 300 feet, they ran out of silver and the mineralization turned into copper. And it was very rich copper. We're talking calcasite and bornite. Pure calcasite is 78% copper. But in 1875, that was not ore because it cost way more to mine it, ship it again to San Francisco or Wales, uh, Scotland, because that's where the other copper smelter was, than it was to, you just couldn't make money at it. The the photograph on the right is of what we believe is one of the original ore buckets from the, the Silver Queen. Some friends of mine 30 years ago were exploring the area and down from the number one shaft location, they found this the iron framework. And I was more than happy to, to buy it from them. We donated it to, to the Arizona Mining and Mineral Museum, and it sits in one of their collections in storage as we speak. Mason Coggan, who was the director of the department at the time I donated it, uh, put the, the wood uh, sheaves back in it to, to more closely resemble what it looked like when it was actually functioning. It was interesting because when he uh, initially did it, he, he installed these things upside down <laughs> and, and somebody pointed out to him that, that he really needed to, to turn it over. But in 1875, 1876, this is what the Silver Queen looked like. We fast forward 30, 35 years, sporadic work on trying to make a go of it at the Silver Queen. And about 1909, Boyce Thompson, who had already founded Newmont Mining Corporation and the Inspiration Consolidated Copper Corp in Miami, Arizona, sent one of his engineers over to take a look at this 400 foot, 500 foot deep shaft at the Silver Queen to see if there was anything interesting there. The geologist came back and said, you know, it, it looks good. By this time, the railroad had at least gotten to Florence. So now it's only 40 miles away. So Boyce Thompson um, took an option and then ultimately bought the property. And to his credit, he devoted the next three or four years of capital and effort to developing the mine to make sure that it was going to have enough ore reserves to justify the additional expense of a, a railroad, concentrator, smelter, all the infrastructure that was going to be necessary. Uh, electric generation, you know, because at this time there was nothing out there except what a mining company brought to the table. So this is a, a photograph of actually a postcard very, very early on in the development of the magma mine. Um, if we were together in the same room, I'd point out that just left of center in this photograph, you see what looks kind of like a, a framework or a lattice work. That's actually the 500 level at it. 
And that is a lattice work of timber. And right at the top of that is the rails where they would push the cars out and they were starting to build the dump at the bottom of the waste rock uh, that was coming out from the development. Number one shaft is actually on the other side of that limestone mountain. And I'll show you a picture of that in a little while so, uh, so you can orient yourself. This is what that same area looks like today. That dump has expanded to the point where just above the, the original high school buildings, that entire area is now a flat working area. So back then, everything that you see up, see now was out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it just didn't exist, but through the passage of time and bringing out all the waste rock, they, they filled in that area and, and made quite a nice working area. In the background, and we'll see a closer picture of that in a minute, is the original tramway coming down off the mountain from number one shaft and then ultimately number two and number three shafts, the aerial tramway, aerial tramway would bring the ore down to this area, offload it onto cars, and then it would be taken out to the mill, which is maybe a quarter of a mile to the left of this picture and to the, the west of, of the area. The other thing, right in the center of the picture, you'll, you'll see a what appears to be a road cut or, or some sort of cut. That's actually the LSNA, the Lake Superior in Arizona mine. And the Lake Superior in Arizona was, uh, uh, was owned by the Calumet and Arizona Mining Company. These were Michigan copper interests that came out and got involved with the Irish mag mine in Bisbee. And they also mined the LSA LSNA down to about the 1600 foot level as a gold mine. No copper, the copper was all leached out or non-existent, but it was a relatively successful gold mine. The specimen on the right is a piece that came out of the Michigan Tech collection. And it uh, was part of the um, we call him a comptroller today or the chief accountant, but he was the chief clerk for the Calumet and Hecla Mining Company and also for Calumet in Arizona and the LSNA. And when his collection was donated to Michigan Tech, it was dis described as the finest private collection of Michigan minerals, Upper Peninsula minerals in existence. Well, he also had a few things like this that, that uh, the former director, Stan Dial, put on display with the idea of enticing me somehow to, to trade for it, which I was more than happy to do a few years later. It's the only gold specimen that I know that exists from the LSNA. So a little bit of the geology, as I mentioned, I'm a mining engineer, but mining engineers take a fair amount of geology, but um, you know, so I can speak intelligently on the geology of the magma mine in this area for about two minutes, and um, then we'll go on to other topics. But the picture on the right are the ore bins of the LSNA, and what's important about this picture is that it also shows the contact of the foot wall quartzite and the hanging wall Martin limestone. Now at depth, you go down 2,500 feet, and that's where the copper mineralization begins. And for the magma mine, the replacement beds in the, the Martin, Naco, and Escobrosa limestones are what sustain the mine for about the final 20 years of its productive life. So very similar to the, the limestone beds in Bisbee and other places, that became the receptive hosts for these mineralizing solutions that, that came up from depth. It now appears that the ore body that the Resolution Copper Corporation is working on and hoping to mine from 
the bottom of our replacement beds were about 4,100 feet. The top of the resolution ore body is 6,000 feet. And so they've got a lot of technological issues to, to deal with, but uh, they seem to be willing to spend the ultimately five or six billion dollars before they produce their first ton of ore. And ultimately, capital spending at the mine will be over ten billion dollars. They've already spent, I think, three billion, and they're still not close to having a mill um, or enough infrastructure to actually start mining. So the picture on the left, uh, the about just just slightly below center is the Troy quartzite that forms the base rock of pretty much the replacement mineralization at the magma mine. And then as you go up, it's the Martin uh, Escobros, I'm sorry, it's the Martin Escobros and then Naco on top. Now, as you drive from the Phoenix area or, you know, uh, from Florence and Coolidge, one of the prominent mountains that you see and if you know where to look for it i can there are places from the valley that that you can actually pick it out on a clear day but this is picket post mountain it was named because a um, back in the day when the first army group of army soldiers that small regiment that was sent out to to build the stoneman grade if it was a small enough group and not much of a uh, an establishment or encampment, it was called a picket post, you know, rather than a fort or 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 whatever. And so the name kind of stuck to the mountain because they originally uh, bivouacked at the base of this mountain, where we now know Hastings was pretty much established. And if you take the old highway towards Boyce Thompson's winter home. There's actually one of these historic markers that the Arizona Highway Department installed a number of years ago uh, along that road. And it describes just what I've uh, mentioned to you. You drive a little further, there's Boyce Thompson's home. Some of you might recognize that if you've ever gone to the Arboretum that carries his name. He established both and then they were donated to the state uh, Parks Department, where it's it's now a world-renowned arboretum. And once you drive a little bit further, there's Apache Leap. And of course, the, the history of that is that there was a, a band of Apache warriors that were driven to the edge of that, that leap by Army cavalry. And rather than surrender and submit to the, the, the soldiers, they leaped to their death off the, the cliff. And of course, the, the myth is that the tears of, of their wives and sisters and daughters crying for them solidified and turned into the Apache tears that were mined just west of Superior for a number of decades. And so the magma mine continued mining and developing, ultimately sinking nine shafts. And I don't know how many miles of underground workings. When you drive, especially from Globe back to Superior and on to Phoenix, as just as you leave the tunnel, the highway tunnel, you see this cut in the side of the hill. It was not mined for ore. In the early days of the mining, it was square set mining, very heavily timbered, but in order to hold the ground and keep the timber from catching fire, they would backfill these cribbed stopes with waste. If there wasn't enough waste coming from the development drifts, then they actually came up to the surface and, and mined from below and mined waste rock so that they could fill their, uh, their cribbed stopes. And the building that you see just right of center is the number three shaft hoist house. Very quickly, num the original Silver Queen shaft, which has been designated as number one shaft, proved impractical because it was sunk pretty much right on the vein. 
that's just not good for long-term mining and, and production. So the first two shafts that they sunk were number two shaft to the north of the vein, number three shaft to the south of the vein, and then ultimately number one shaft was pretty much mined through. It was a very hot mine. Uh, 4,100 level of the, the number nine shaft. Virgin rock temperature was 150 degrees. And I experienced that a time or two. But for the most part, the most of the stoves were relatively not comfortable, but but the working conditions were pretty decent. We we had thousands of tons equivalent of 37 degree water being pumped underground on a continuous basis. And so each stope, each development drift heading had its own, if you will, refrigeration unit, heat exchanger and, and a 50 horsepower fan, you know, blow all the windows out of your house if, if you tried to use that on, on your home. But back in the 30s or 40s, Mr. Carrier of Carrier Air Conditioning and Refrigeration fame designed this cooling tower for the magma mine. Um, very quickly, its capacity was reached and, and there were some headings that were just, the guys could work for 20 minutes and then they had to go back to a cool area for an hour to recover. And that was pretty much their, their shift. The picture on the right is the aerial tramway that I showed you that distant shot of uh, back about 1978 or so. And this is a shot from on top of the hill of number nine shaft where I worked for nine years. The cooling towers are in the in front of that shaft. Uh, again, I think we were pumping 3,000 gallons a minute underground and cooling it to 37 degrees for distri distribution throughout the mine. Number nine shaft was a 22 is a 22 foot diameter concrete line shaft, and it was sunk. It's actually 4,750 feet deep. The bottom level was the 4,100, which was near the bottom of the shaft. The difference is uh, nomenclature is that, that you start counting from the collar of the shaft down. So the 100 feet down, if that's the first level, uh, you know, that's the 100 foot level or first level, whatever. Uh, but there was a, a about a 500 or 600 foot elevation difference between the old side of the mine and number nine shaft. So to keep the nomenclature the same because the levels that were being driven at least down to 3600 were all driven from the old side of the mine and connected up with number nine shaft. So it didn't make much sense to break through from the 3600 from the old side into number nine shaft and then immediately call it something else. And, and so uh, just just one of the interesting nuances of the, the mining at number nine shaft. Uh, gentleman on the right, is a, a co-worker and friend of mine, he's standing in one of the stopes. This is actually a cross cut and I'll, I'll show you a map explaining this, but in the replacement beds, we would drive an east-west cross cut, 10 feet wide and generally 20 feet high. So he's actually standing on timber, a wooden floor, and there's 10 feet open underneath him. That kind of circular thing that you see on the left lower corner is what we call a vent bag or flexoid. That's where the cool air would be pumped into these stopes. Everything was heavily timbered. They were nine or 10 foot tall posts, 10 foot caps. And once we mined a 10 by 20 foot heading to the, the waste boundary, we'd fill it back up with cement rich tailings or the ground waste material from the concentration process, fill that, that panel up, and then that allowed us to mine next to it and achieve as close to 100% extraction of the ore body as possible. And so this is what the replacement bed in the Escobrosa limestone looks look like. This was 
what we designated called our C bed. It was the largest replacement bed. So each one of those little squares on the left hand photograph is a 10 by 10 foot heading. Um, on the right, you see about not uh, just above center, that's the east west heading uh, cross cut. And then we would drive north south panels out of that until we had extracted the entire ore body. Once, once we extracted everything on, let's say, the 3400 level, we would drop down 20 feet and do it again. And that's what you see in that left hand photograph why there are squares, not just on the main level, but below. Uh, and, and so the mining all took place underhand. And that was to take advantage of once you put in all of this timber, we could eliminate some of those, some of the timber as we mined underneath. This is what the magma mine looks like today when you drive up to the top of Devil's Canyon at Oak Flats. You'll see this road that says my magma mine road if you drive up to it you you can get close enough to take this photograph number nine shaft is in the background resolution sunk number 10 shaft to access the the potential ore body and i i say that because until you can mine it bring it out of the ground and make money at it it is not ore it's just a interesting geologic structure or a mineralized body they bottomed number 10 shaft out i want to say around 6500 feet some somewhere in that that vicinity they started a year or so ago deepening number nine shaft from 4600 feet uh to take it down to the the porphyry body as well and so now some of the minerals Magma was, was a, a high-grade copper operation throughout its entire life. But again, it required a lot of timbering. It was expensive. It was very labor intensive. Fortunately, there were miners that, that preserved some of the, the crystals. Even though chalcosite was one of our predominant ore minerals, it very, very rarely crystallized. There was one small pocket in a stope we all thought it was hematite because the face with the gang material was hematite and the face looked like solid hematite until the assays came back and, and they they were showing 20% copper, which was even high grade for, for magma. And there was one small pocket of these crystals that originally we thought were just hematite. But um, once they found out that they were calcocyte, I, uh, I had to pay the price, but that's okay. We, we also saw occasional uh, calcocyte coatings on pyrite. A colloquial name for that is ducktownite. And uh, this particular that particular specimen is uh, just a hair over two inches high. So the main crystal is over an inch. The crystals on the left, that calcocyte crystal, the longest crystal is approaching an inch. Interestingly enough, even though magma was always a sulfide ore body, primary sulfides, occasionally we would find a, a bit of native copper. And on the deepest level, where the 4100 level crossed the, the magma vein, our geologists found a few crystallized native coppers of all things. Most of the specimens that we see recovered from the magma mine really came out in the last well, from about 1975 on, there was a group of geologists and uh, one or two mining engineers besides myself and, and a few of the other production folks that had an interest. And so besides the miners, a few miners uh, were ardent collectors, but there really wasn't much before about 1958. That's when the, the great barites and pyrites were hit except for this specimen. It's a tetrahedrite on quartz. Those are tetrahedrite crystals. This came out of the collection of E.O. Stratton. He was a miner, rancher, promoter back from about 1880 to 1920 here in Arizona. His collection was preserved, but 
hidden away until about 15 years ago. And when it came came onto the market, there were a number of Bisbee, nice Bisbee things and a few other oddball things, and including this single tetrahedrite on quartz. So the mining for the first 50 years was in the magma vein, a vertical vein uh, up to 20 and 30 feet thick. This is where all the square setting was taking place. And there was a smaller parallel vein called the Kerner vein that was mined for a while. And when the miners went into their stope one, one day after a blast, and I talked to one of the miners because he, he was uh, still working at the mine, he said it looked like there was all this corrugated tin hanging down from the, the back of the stope. Well, it turned out that it was sheet silver. Now, the romance of the story is that once the mine management found out about it, they, they hauled all of this material out in, in sample sacks and, and carried it directly to the smelter. Well, the fact of the matter is that that wasn't as much for security as it was for the fact that if they'd sent it through the mill, they would have lost all the silver because silver, like na native copper, doesn't crush. And milling requires crushing. And so they were really wanting to make sure that by taking it directly to the smelter that they would be able to recover all, all of the silver. Chalcopyrite was our prime ore mineral. Uh, some interesting forms, the, the bubbly version on the left resembles classic material out of England. There, there were some crystallized chalcopyrites. That's the specimen on the right is actually almost three inches left to right. It's a huge crystalline mass. I wouldn't call it a chalcopyrite crystal, but interestingly enough, those black crystals on top are sphalerite. So one of the, the two, possibly three, main collectible minerals from the magma mine are pyrite. In the late 50s, when they started mining the replacement beds, we referred to them as the A-beds. They were in that, that quartzite limestone contact. Uh, magma became at least nationally renowned for its fine pyrites. Crystals up to two inches across, pyritohedrons, the miniature on the right is two and a half inches. Those are inch plus crystals. The single pyritohedron on the right is almost two inches in diameter. And there was a bit of manganese at the mine. Uh, one day I walked into our South Vein Stopes and lo and behold, there was a, a lump of massive rhodochrosite in the face. And so I was able to collect four or five pieces. That particular specimen has the distinction of having been the finest specimen of Arizona rhodochrosite entered at the annual Tucson Gem and Mineral Show back when rhodochrosite was the theme mineral but the judges ruled it not good enough quality to be awarded a, a trophy. So I'm, I'm, I think in some ways happier that I didn't get the trophy than if I did. Uh, grautite on the right, crystallized grautite is a manganese oxide. And um, once we recognized what it was and identified it, I've seen it on specimens from three or four locations throughout the mine as we would get right at the ore waste contact right up against the limestone, occasionally we, we'd see this manganese. Gypsum, because of the, the sulfide mineralization and, and some of the interaction with the, uh, the limestones, it would occasionally produce gypsum crystals. The piece on the right came out in 1980. Uh, very attractive bow tie looking set of crystals that are about two and a half inches wide on a one inch barite crystal. The gypsum specimen on the right, those crystals, the longest crystal is about three inches across or in length on crystallized calcite matrix. And so the, the second or one of the, the other collectible species from, cal, uh, from magma is calcite. Two and a half inch doubly terminated crystal on the left, uh, interesting stacked faced crystals on the right. And we see this kind of stacking in a number of occurrences throughout the mine. 
but the the single finest calcite pocket from magma and i rank it up against anything that bisbee's ever produced and i just love the malachite or cuprite and calcites from there or ray or, or aho was this one pocket that was hit on the 3700 level producing these ice clear twinned crystals the one on the left is not quite two inches the one on the right is about is over an inch and a half um crystal on the left is a bit over an inch on a piece of matrix the one on the right is three inches across this is one of the ones that i collected i was the uh, level boss and i missed this pocket by eight hours they they hit it at on day shift so by nine o'clock they they barred down and and thrown out the entire pocket some of the specimens were saved most were not this piece the the main crystal is about an inch and a half left to right but some of the other calcite occurrences that i was able to to collect over the next few years 3500 this was a specimen that i sold to a friend of mine reg barnes and then a number of years later when he sold his collection to me i was able to to get it back um series of water courses from the 3440s level down to the 3512 level this water course produced crystals of this kind of shape kind of a wheat sheave type shape whenever we hit it uh, starting in, um, my first experience was on the 3512 level of the 352 c stove then we hit it twice on the 3440 level and once on the 3460 level and each one of those pockets was slightly different a uh, specimen on the left is another one of those with that kind of stair step stair step stacking and the one on the right is just uh, uh, a nice calcite specimen on black hematite pieces about three and a half inches left to right more calcites one from the 4100 level on a uh, plate of of calcopyrite and some rounded rhombohedrons when a uh, friend of mine first collected those we were kind of hoping that they were smithsonites but of course they turned out to be calcites and here's the prime mineral from that magma is most famous for it's barites again these were hit in the 1958 time frame in the replacement beds along with the pyrites golden barites like this one crystals up to inch and a half two inches across and ranging in color from uh, almost white to gray to green to red to gold and black now the these two specimens came out of a, a stope on the out of the naco side um, 30 years later it was a complete surprise, but a very pleasant surprise. The main crystal on the left hand specimen is inch and a half tip to tip. These are two more from the, the original A bed replacement. Unfortunately, about 1959 or 1960, this part of the mine caught fire. And so the mine basically shut down for nine months while they fought this fire and contained it enough to put the rest of the mine back into production. But this area produced carbon monoxide until about 1980. And even though there was probably a lot of good ore still left there, the, the risk of opening that area up and a, a flash fire starting and the whole thing starting over again just wasn't worth it. And besides that, we, the infrastructure of the mine it, had moved beyond it. But you can see that specimen on the right, that main crystal is almost two inches. Two more from the 3600, golden crystal on the left, about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half wide. What was interesting about this pocket was up to about the size of this one on the left, the crystals could be golden. But once they got much larger, and I think it's due to included pyrite, they turn black. The specimen on the right, however, you've got two golden crystals uh, on sitting behind the much larger 
almost black crystal. We have one crystal in Paula's collection, like the one on the left, that's half black, half golden. Uh, Les, yeah, I, I have a question. You've used the sure. you've used the the word uh, several times, but uh, we have a question. What is a stoke? Well, act, uh, <laughs> uh, actually, the word is stope. Stope. So, so there are two major working headings in the mind. One is is the drift, a drift heading, or a development heading. So, a drift heading, a drift, is basically the access to get you to the ore. All right. So, from number nine shaft, you're driving through limestone. You're driving a drift. Once you get to the ore body, you establish that east-west crosscut, and that east-west crosscut and the level that you're mining the ore from, that now becomes a stope. And so the stopes were named at magma based on which bed that they were in. So what you see in front of you is the 3600 4D stope. We had five replacement horizons, A, B, C, D, and E. The main ones that we were mining towards the end were the C, D, and E. So as soon as you saw the name of a stope, you knew which replacement area that you were in. The second would be the first four numbers, which would be the level that that stope started at. So this one started at the 3600 level, which was the same level as the haulage. And where we found these barites was either the, I think it's the 3620 level. So that was the first cut underneath. And the stope went on to mine at least two more cuts underneath that. The, the fifth number, that four in front of the D, would generally uh, be the cross cut that the stope started from. So this particular stope started on the 3600 level from the four cross cut west and it was in the D bed. And so the stope is where the mine where the ore was produced. So Great. it's S T O P E. Right. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I, and yeah, and there's a typo, I'm sure. No, no, no. Just, just, uh, just one or two more slides, and and then I'll take any other questions. So right. both of these came out of that 3600 4D stope. What's interesting about the one on the right is the matrix. Uh, there are very small hopper galena crystals on it, and there's this bubbly kind of yellowish material. It turns out to be sphalerite. And this, this is my last slide. This is the largest single barite specimen I know of from the mine. It's 10 inches left to right. The crystals average about five eighths or three quarters of an inch. You know, one of these that came out of the, the 3000 A bed back 1958, 59. And, and a friend of mine uh, ran onto it and then very magnanimously traded it to me and extracted a few nice things from me for the, uh, the privilege. And so with that, are there any questions? Yes, I, I, I've got a couple of here. Okay. Gonna, there we go. Um, uh, I'm, I probably missed it. Did, did you say or do you know when the Silver Queen started operation? Silver Queen, the, uh, the original exploration on the Silver Queen was contemporaneous with the Silver King. So 18, I mean, it was first discovered in 1874. By 1876 or 1877, there was shaft sinking. That that picture that I showed you, that, that would be 1876, 1877. But by okay. 1880, they'd run out of silver. Okay. I, I just, I missed that then. Um, no, okay. And do you have any, of, any idea of the tonnage of ore that's or that's come out of either of the mines. I I I know that's all. Well, I I can I can cite you some statistics. The Silver King lasted longer than any of the original locators thought. The main shaft was sunk down to either the nine hundred or thousand foot level, 
But the, the problem with the Silver King is it's what we call a pipe. And, and so very, very localized and very contained ore, uh, ore structures. So there wasn't a lot of lateral extent to the mine. Those production figures, all I can do is talk about, uh, you know, how rich the, the ore was and that sort of thing. At Magma, and actually I, I should have researched or should have some of these numbers, but it, during the time that I was there, we were producing 3,000 tons a day of 5% uh, copper. And I want to, so 5% copper and something on the order of, well, let me give you this number. We produced 8 million pounds of copper a month, 90,000 ounces of silver. No, a million ounces of silver and 90,000 ounces of gold a month. I think those those are the numbers. And and so there were always stories that, that magma wasn't really a copper mine. It was a gold and silver mine. <laughs> that that was ne that was not the case. It, it was fairly high in gold and silver, and the gold and silver credits could be significant as much as twenty five or thirty cents a pound per pound of copper. So if you're producing eight million pounds of copper and thirty cents of that is is gold and silver, that's a fair chunk of change. There are mines like Bingham Canyon in Utah mm -hmm. that is as much a gold mine as it is a copper mine. Uh, Freeport, Indonesia's mine at Tembagapura uh, on the island of Irian Jaya. There are months that they produce all of their copper for, for zero at no cost because the gold is paying for the entire operation. Okay. Uh, let's see. The last thing I have here for you is uh, Chris says, nice presentation less. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chris. <laughs> All right. I thank you very much, Les. I'll let You're you go. Welcome. And um, uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. And I'll say goodbye to everybody here and uh, let them know what's coming up. All right. All thanks, right. Thanks again, Bob. Thank you. All right. Uh, this has been the Pinal Gem and Mineral Society month meeting of for November 2020 and the Pinal Geology and Mineral Museum monthly meeting for November 2020. I'm Bob and I'm your host for these meetings. We will have another one on December 16th. We don't at the same time, same channel, uh, seven o'clock Arizona time, which is this for this time of year is seven o'clock for mountain time as well. We uh, don't have a, um, a speaker to announce tonight, but we hope uh, to have one soon. Right, Tish? I will see you uh, all next month and online in, in between. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate your coming. Good night, everybody. <laughs>